Um, first up on the lineup is Kia Koitler, who is a writer, artist, gardener, amateur astronomer, organizer, and developer interested in how cultural narratives and technologies shape their use. Since 2017, she has led strategy at Gnosis, developing decentralized infrastructure for Web3. Now she focuses on building Zodiac, a collection of tools built according to an open standard for decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs. She also contributes to other internet research group and sits on the board of Regen Foundation. Today, Kia Koitler presents her prehistory of DAOs. So anybody new to the crypto space, we're going to walk you through uh, from the beginning to now. And with that, I will turn it over to Kia. Hey, I'm Kia Krutler, and my talk is on a prehistory of DAOs, cooperatives, gaming guilds, and the networks to come. You can find me on Twitter at Kia Krutler and our team at Gnosis Guild. So the term DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It comes from imagining how features of decentralized technology, like global digital assets, censorship resistance, and automated actions will change how organizations operate. DAOs today could also be described as internet native organizations. The term DAO first appeared in the Ethereum blockchain community in 2014. Though terms like decentralized autonomous corporation or decentralized autonomous company, DAC, circulated in the Bitcoin space prior. The first experiment under the term's name called DAO, launched as a decentralized funding organization which raised over 150 million equivalent ether, its native currency, to its code in 2016. Uh, the experiment proved short-lived, however, and the DAO was hacked one month after launch. And despite this, a lot more experiments have gone on in the DAO space since. And I would argue that while the term DAO is new, the ideas behind it are. <clears throat> you can see this in the form of networks. Uh, a popular term among think tanks of the 20th century. And seen in this 1995 report, Tribes, Institutions, Markets, Networks by David Runfelt and published by the Rand Corporation. The report presents four types of organizational forms through which humanity has supposedly progressed. And key to this framework is not the idea that one organizational form replaces the next, but rather that it both supplements and curtails the one that preceded it. And of relevance for DAOs, networks in the report have a key distinguishing feature from the organizational forms that precede them. They're described as multi-organizational, meaning they connect multiple organizations. And they facilitate the growth of distributed web-like global enterprises and increasingly so-called virtual corporations. And neither public nor private, the primary domain of multi-organizational networks is a third autonomous social sector identified in the report as civil society. And I like to bring up this report in the context of DAOs, Web3, and internet native organization discourse, because I think that the discourse today, whether knowingly or not, inherits a lot from reports like the one published by RAND. And RAND was a nonprofit think tank established, or is a nonprofit think tank established in 1948 that went on to advise the US military and government. And so a lot of the discourse around internet native organization inherits a type often of Western liberalism, as well as a type of soft power that other civil society organizational forms would go on to export in the decades following the 90s. And I'm of the belief that the more you recognize the lineage, the easier it becomes to change. And in this vein, I would say that with the report's emphasis on civil society's three letter acronyms for organizations, NGOs, NPOs, and PVOs, a future one appears naturally missing, DAOs. So DAOs today, DAOs in 2021. DAOs, I would offer a working definition, might be best described as voluntary associations with the operating principles of digital cooperativism. And I say cooperativism here in the sense that DAOs do not embrace necessarily an organizational form or legal structure that looks like traditional cooperatives, but rather that they embrace cooperativism more as a protocol, a set of economic relations between the members that prioritize co-ownership. And as voluntary associations, they are a cross-jurisdictional way for strangers, friends, or unlikely allies to pseudonymously come together towards shared goals, 
usually supported by a token model, incentives, and governance held in common. And it's important to keep in mind that DAOs are not reducible to technical protocols for governance or the software that they use, but rather they're communities that coordinate through collective vibes. And today the DAO landscape is blooming with a bunch of different categories of DAOs highlighted by Cooper Turley, such as protocol DAOs, which steward the development of decentralized software. There's service DAOs that offer things like freelance work. There's investment and grants DAOs that distribute funds. And there's collectors DAOs that collect artworks, as well as media DAOs that seek to be a new type of media studio. And while not reducible to the software it uses, um, many joke today that DAOs are simply a group chat and a bank account. And to give some specific instances of what this looks like, most often DAOs today are comprised of a Discord server, which is a big multi-channel chat room usually organized by topic, and a multi-sig, often a Gnosis safe multi-sig. And multi-signature accounts you can think of kind of like um, traditional joint bank accounts, except you can create them online, usually within a couple of minutes, pseudonymously across jurisdictions with your friends. And here's a screenshot of a multi-sig by a popular grants program in the blockchain space. And this grants program is controlled by four out of six owners. Um, this means multi-sig kind of directly translates to multi-signature. Multiple signers have to confirm a transaction in order for it to go through. In this case, four out of six, although every account can set it custom. And while deceptively simple as a piece of software, multi-sigs have become really important for DAOs to set up and get started quickly as a group that wants to hold assets in common. And this is a screenshot of the Pleaser DAO multi-sig. Um, Pleaser DAO is an art collector DAO. And they've also issued an internal governance token as well as an external uh, token for fractionalization of ownership of the works that allows those who to contribute to the DAO basically to vote on which artworks they will acquire next. And I think what's most interesting from, from Pleaser DAO and Collector DAOs in general from an arts institutional perspective is that they invite, often invite the artists they collect to become members of the DAO in turn, which basically dissolves the usual distinctions between artists, gallerists, and collectors. And also because most DAOs represent governance rights through a token, in some sense, you could say tokens Trojan horse principles of co-ownership, so of cooperatives directly into highly financialized spaces. And while I think tokenization is far from the answer to the social media web two woes, um, I would say that I think for DAOs with the mission of economic value creation, a token becomes a useful mechanism on three fronts, bootstrapping initial funding, distributing governance white rights widely and granularly, as well as aligning an ecosystem of DAOs. So not only one organization, but many. And in this light, and I would say since the space um, is relatively new, there are very few um, kind of guiding principles or norms around value creation. I would offer one to say that Web3 applications could aim to introduce value in relations which have been historically denied it, like labor and environment rather than creating new financialized relations. This is where DAOs could learn much from cooperatives. And cooperatives are enterprises managed and owned by their members. And the 1844 Rochdale principles for cooperatives, which are still embraced and used by cooperatives today, outline a few key principles by which they operate. So these include voluntary and open membership, member economic participation, as well as things like cooperation among cooperatives. And while many DAOs might not draft this list, I would also counter that many could have easily written this similar list of values today. And perhaps where DAOs most strongly intersect with the blockchain space, with uh, the cooperative space, is through ideas like Nathan Schneider's exit to community. Um, so in a 2019 post, he details a third path. So startups, rather than giving the initial IPO or a corporate acquisition, can choose a third way and share what they've created with the people who value it most. In the case of a social media platform, this could be giving co-ownership to its users, as well as governance rights about how the platform develops. And in a great paper called Fostering Worker Cooperatives with Blockchain Technology, Morshek Manan highlights three dilemmas cooperative space today. Um, these relate to basically raising initial funds, um, international governance as they scale across borders and face bureaucratic hurdles, and also alignment, both bureaucratic and cultural coherence as cooperatives increase in size. 
And definitely not the panacea to cooperative dilemmas, but one potential solution. Certain DAO patterns highlighted before related to bootstrapping initial funding, widely distributing governance rights, and aligning not only one organization, but many could be of use. DAOs also could learn from cooperatives in their emphasis on long-termism. So long-term patterns about how economic assets should be held, as well as the well-being of the members and the environment they participate in. DAOs can also learn from gaming guilds. So in massively multiplayer online games, MMOs, players are mostly free to set their own goals, loosely guided by the open game world narrative. Referred to an MMO as broadly as guilds, clans, or alliances, these groups average in size between 40 to 150 participants, though they can go up to 1,000 in size. And their goals could include defeating difficult enemies or constructing useful tools, basically anything that's usually out of the scope of one player acting alone. This includes mega projects like uh, constructing a Titan-class warship in EVE Online. And what guilds have realized is that it's really important for the same players to work together again because they usually have characters with complementary skill sets, as well as established patterns of cooperation. And key to guild members working together again is the distribution of loot or the distribution of resources and its perceived fairness. So loot are in-game items usually dropped after a successful mission. And to deal with their distribution, uh, many guilds have established different systems for keeping track of participation. Um, one of the most robust and resilient is the 1999 system Dragon Kill Points, which has evolved greatly since and is used in many game servers today. And you could say that DKP acts as a private money system, separate from any existing currency in a game world, and they're distributed to guild members based on their participation in raids. And then guild members can in turn spend these participation points or private money in exchange for loot items in a transparent manner. And out of the scope of this talk, there's a great paper called Dragon Kill Points, a summary white paper by Castronova and Fairfield that de delves into one World of Warcraft server's DKP system. That's absolutely fantastic. And I would say that these kind of guild patterns of Dragon Kill Points or DKP, as well as autonomous dispute resolution, so ways to resolve dispute between guild members without resorting to traditional um, legal forms usually, as well as the market allocation of publicly owned goods, as you see in many DKP systems, could greatly inform several DAO dilemmas today. So at the moment, a lot of DAOs are really struggling with how to adequately and considerately and meaningfully track reputation, participation, and contribution among their members. In that turn, they struggle to distribute resources fairly. Um, by looking towards systems like DKP, DAOs could also increase trust and, and kind of also show that Often with the kind of meme around blockchain technology being trustless, it overshadows the fact that teams often working as smaller teams within DAOs need to work together repeatedly and develop a, develop a level of coherence and trust. I think DAOs can also learn um, from gaming guilds with particular insights uh, raised by researcher Joshua Citarella um, that many DKP systems resemble a form of market socialism in which goods are publicly owned but allocated by markets. And I think shadow economics could be an app term for, like this for when a group operates through an economic form, it would not be likely to label itself as. So this is DAOs as digital cooperatives and gaming guilds as market socialism. As many DAOs would, might not explicitly embrace the label of cooperatives and maybe gamers might not explicitly call themselves market socialists, they still engage in economic practices which resemble these forms. And as the blockchain socialist writes, um, we should be building organizing platforms owned by users and workers where it doesn't matter what, that someone tweets something you might disagree with, but whether or not they're helping us reach concrete political objectives. And here, whether you disagree with a Twitter handle or otherwise, DAOs hold some opportunity. Um, and I think in DAOs ambiguity and their kind of ahistoricity, there is an opportunity for a collaboration across existing ideologies and polarization divides. Um, and also on the flip term uh, of this like um, huge opportunity for experimentation with different economic practices, we also face the real possibility that DAOs are co-optable, better or worse, for different ends at the moment. And this is why I really encourage more people to get in involved in this space now, when it's a little bit of upstream of these experimentation impacts. And in terms of DAOs to come and their impacts, DAOs after 2021. So I think that DAOs will not be the uniformly non-hierarchical network, some imagine. 
although they will have pockets of flat hierarchies. Instead, I think DAOs will coordinate across different levels of coherence and trust. And I could roughly sketch out three layers of a DAO. There would be a token, and then teams, guilds, and squads represented by token ownership that often work together on missions, milestones, and raids, or larger scale public works that are financed by token ownership. And from these layers, something like a hierarchical network emerges, meaning an organization that possesses the ability to be ranked in multiple ways. So from the perspective of one DAO, such as DAO B, in a given ecosystem of DAOs, you could see a series of teams and goals. And from another DAO, DAO C's um, perspective, we could see overlapping goals and teams collaborating towards similar ends, but a different hierarchy emerges. And because programmable tokens can be distributed in a more granular way to teams like such, one of the promises of DAOs that they've yet to deliver on, but still um, people kind of hold as something like a holy grail or an ideological endpoint, is that because they can be distributed in a more granular way than traditional corporate interests, memberships, or shares, the possibility for a new type of token holder company formation comes to the fore, which can incorporate incorporate greater practical knowledge and governance without increasing transaction costs, or in other words, um, decreasing organizational efficiency. And this idea of incorporating greater practical knowledge or tacit knowledge and governance, I think is most clearly shown by the Regen Network, which is a public blockchain for ecosystem services that has set aside 30% of their tokens for land stewards, climate scientists, and indigenous peoples to take part in managing the value the network produces, as well as governance of the protocol in the long term. And that way you get literally on the ground stakeholders involved in your governance process over um, the long term kind of economic outcomes of their field. <clears throat> and for this reason, it's important to look beyond token governance. So while tokens can distribute governance rights, we should also move beyond token voting as the first solution to decision making. Instead, we can look to identity systems like proof of personhood systems, proof of participation, retroactive public goods funding, as well as other mechanisms to combat vote, combat vote buying or other issues. I would also offer that tokens are, in some sense, a new form of digital object that will take time to establish norms around. So these won't always look like traditional um, corporate shareholder or stakeholder rights, and they won't always look like economic assets but instead will become a more programmable form of governance that highlights opportunities that we've yet to articulate, but will soon. And so it's some, and I would also say here um, that because tokens have primarily built worlds around speculation and exit, many are not keen to get involved with the space. But I would also say that as new types of tokens emerge, they will build worlds around entrance too, attaching to how physical resources are governed. And in summary, gamer guilds, cooperatives using software, and group chats, often DAOs look at these forms and say, oh my god, is this an entirely new organizational form in the history of human civilization? And while it's not today, I would actually offer that it potentially could be. So I think in the networks to come, uh, their digital primacy, meaning that they initially organize online and also manage digital assets primarily, allow some not to take seriously the fact that things like cooperative principles plus gaming guilds and odd imaginaries like DAOs present an emergent organizational form with legitimate political relevance. And why I think it's important to give things like DAOs political relevance today is because we don't want those on the other side of the digital divide to suddenly realize that they haven't been included in stakeholders when this does become a legitimate political form or really operationalizes in mainstream practice. And that's why we should actively cultivate more and more stakeholders in these organizations while they're still young. And I would offer one kind of speculative form through which different organizations and DAOs could participate in the political sphere and transform towards more impactful ends, for better or worse, once again. And I'll quickly read a paragraph from my essay by the same name, A Prehistory of DAOs, towards the speculative end. So to call attention to the chimeric's terms, failings at seriousness, many return to its misnomer. The A in DAO does not live up to its autonomous reference. And even though the term DAO remains poetically correct, we could propose an occasional replacement, decentralized avatar organizations. Such organizations would take their political stakes both lightly and heavily. 
As Audrey Tang notes, the days of avatar politicians are already here. Avatar politicians are virtual beings that represent, rally, and advocate on behalf of political platforms. And when automation increases, they may even spawn their own political platforms. A decentralized avatar organization would recognize the coming virtual zeitgeist. This could look like collectively managed cyborg like Lil Michaela, or an entire environment shaped by members like trust moving castles. And decentralized avatar organizations will have collectively developed interoperable game worlds, engines, or virtual being mascots at their core, which co-create the culture around which their members organize. And as is the case in this ex example and speculation with massively multiplayer online games, I would say that DAOs are less technical protocols for governance and more high stakes game worlds that interweave, and we should treat them as such. Because we may say things like DAO versus PAC or a political action committee, so a fundraising committee for political candidates or party lines in the United States, as soon as 2024 or before them. For this reason, we must remember that we need to aim not only for code, but we should aim for rough consensus and running worlds. Thanks. And you can find this talk and hopefully a longer, more nuanced essay form at our blog, gnosisguild.mirror.xyz, as well as some more info about the DAO tools that we work on at Gnosis Guild. Everybody, welcome back. Um, I'm joined here today by Executive Director of Gray Area, Barry Thru, and Kia Koitler, who just walked us through uh, a prehistory of DAOs. Um, thank you so much for that presentation, Kia. It was so informative. And I think these are histories that people, you know, often, uh, you know, are, you know, many, most people that I see in the crypto space are definitely unaware of, of how, you know, this trajectory came to be. So I found that super, super useful. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before I kind of jump into, you know, some of the questions that I have, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, you know, the origin of the origin of Zodiac, the origin of Gnosis Safe, which I know that you're deeply, you know, that's your project, um, and kind of how you how you became, you know, enmeshed in these in these conversations around security and community organization um, and blockchain technologies. Sure. So it's been a bit of a journey. Um, I studied more philosophy and art. And then over a period of several years, I kind of self-trained as a developer and did a lot of community organizing around the distributed cooperative space. And then when Ethereum started really getting going, you know, post-2016, um, I saw a kind of interesting confluence of different interests of my own, but also a really interesting opportunity for different types of organizing, which I think was in large part overshadowed by much of the dominant press narratives around crypto today. And basically, a year after I got more meshed in the kind of Ethereum ecosystem, I joined Gnosis, which is the company I'm still working at today. And I've done strategy and comms there for the last four years. And it's been a really amazing process to see both how our team or now teams have developed, as well as how the space has developed, both in some areas for amazing work and some areas for less so. <laughs> um, and basically, how Gnosis has evolved over time is that we built uh, some prediction market platforms and general frameworks that people could use for event-based assets. And then also there's products like the Gnosis Safe, um, which has come a long way since it's initially written by our CTO um, to hold kind of Gnosis funds in general. And then gradually was updated went under, through a lot of security processes and has become pretty much the most trusted uh, smart contracts or kind of code in the space and used by many, many projects today, many teams. You can set it up in 60 minutes just on a website that anyone can go to. Um, so Gnosis Safe became one of the Gnosis core products almost by accident. Um, although today, all of the design around it is very intentional and the use within communities is very intentional. And through my process at Gnosis, I was always very interested more so in the kind of governance aspect of crypto rather than the kind of market-based solutions, let's say. and as Gnosis has evolved and we now have several product lines, there's also a DEX. Um, we maintain an Ethereum client as well. And Gnosis has become a kind of generalized, decentralized infrastructure company, basically making tech that goes across Ethereum and probably any other EVM or just technically compatible chains in the future. Um, and from this and my interest in governance, I've had the opportunity with uh, currently called co-founder Oren McMillan to basically formulate and bring together a small team within Gnosis 
to work on Gnosis Guild and Zodiac. So Gnosis Safe, you can think of as in a presentation, like something like a traditional joint bank account, but one that you can make online very quickly with a team, with an organization. And we were using this actually for Gnosis DAO and initializing Gnosis DAO, um, which is a project that Gnosis does to kind of do community stewardship of the Gnosis products and the Gnosis treasury. And we realized in initiating Gnosis DAO that there was a lot of tools that DAOs need that um, actually aren't built at the moment. So Orin and I saw this opportunity to basically build on Gnosis Safe and a tool set that fundamentally at its core really allows organizations to evolve. So you have the Gnosis Safe wallet, trusted, holds funds, you can set it up really easily. Um, but I think what is missing in the DAO space more from the product side today is that many platforms have kind of one governance style, one voting style, one way to gain membership. And when you set up this platform, you're kind of, for better or worse, locked in. You can change some parameters of this governance style, like how long it takes a vote to pass or um, the kind of required bond for more secure proposals. Uh, but the fundamental kind of governance style can't necessarily evolve. Whereas um, Gnosis Guild tooling and Zodiac, which we're calling it, is like a collection of tools and an open standard on which Dell tools can be built. And we use the Gnosis Safe at its core, but basically put these tools around the safe so that an organization can evolve over time. They're like living, breathing organisms rather than static, you know, Web2 platforms. And so the Zodiac uh, tool set allows uh, teams in Gnosis Safe to take a bunch of different organic pathways to how the, an organization could evolve. So some of the tools that we've built are things that um, right now with the Gnosis Safe, there's like, a, as I mentioned in the talk, there's like a set amount of signers given a decision, say four out of six people have to confirm a transaction for it to be executed. Using Zodiac, you can basically have a tool that allows any successful proposal to the Gnosis Safe to be executed by anyone in the community, not just people who have signing power on the Gnosis Safe. So it's a way to open organizations and also open access to resources without having to change the fundamental underlying technical infrastructure. You just kind of build on it and plug and play and evolve. And we kind of joke about it as uh, the expansion pack for DAOs. Um, like in the same way that video games, you kind of have like existing storylines or existing characters, but then later the developers or even sometimes spurred by community storylines, the developers come up with an expansion pack that basically connects different storylines, can bring new areas to the map, can evolve certain characters. And basically, as the expansion pack for DAO is seeking to build on existing tech and really bridge across different platforms and different organizing practices, rather, and keeping it fully an open standard so that we don't end up with the same kind of singular monolithic platform, that platform paradigm that has evolved from Web2. Wow, I mean, this is such amazing work because I think for me, the like I, I agree with you. I think that the governance uh, side of crypto conversations are are much more interesting than the transactional ones right now because of the capacity for community organization, for transparency, for connection with other people, and then the management of those resources. Um, you know, outside uh, outside of Gray Area Festival, I work uh, I work on technology diplomacy initiatives for the Canadian government, actually. And so we talk a lot about governance and building tools from the ground up so that they are built ethically, securely, um, and, uh, you know, are, and they're rooted in, you know, human rights, but also in something that is truly valuable for, for every user. Um, and I'm wondering how you approach this, how do you approach this kind of ethical development of this governance protocol, right? Like, you know, I'm sure that you want to build something that is baked in to be something that cannot be abused or used in improper ways and kind of what's your uh, tactic and to, you know, to make sure that your the product that you're developing um, is is rooted in, in in positive impact. Sure. So there's a few different ways to approach those questions, um, and I think all of them are equally important. On a kind of more technical side, I would say that the tool set that we're building um, fundamentally wants to build organizations that are more accessible to a broader membership, but also organizations, as I said, that can evolve over time. So this means that there could be a vote passed to actually change the voting style. Because often you find in um, organizations the ability to make decisions or to decide about the formal processes by which decisions are made um, is sometimes not possible. And you see this actually as a fundamental pattern within a lot of existing tech or social platforms and DAOs, that they're actually the kind of fundamental governance processes are very rarely part of the debate. 
Um, so on a technical infrastructure layer, we want to assure that changing an organization is always possible um, by whatever kind of due process or otherwise, and also that it can basically be ported across platforms and never be linked to specifically one. I do think that this question of um, kind of the impact framework is much more on the cultural pattern side. So I like to think of like technical objects as their or technical infrastructures. Of course, they're not always technical or not only technical, they're also social and cultural and political in nature. And just being able to see how technical objects kind of create and have a feedback loop with cultural patterns. So it's the question of what type of cultures do DAOs have? And I think it varies in terms of like, what is the ethics of the application of the DAO based on given contacts and its end. So there isn't necessarily one per prescriptive norm across all DAOs, but by being able to build technical patterns that are replicated as cultural patterns, like being able to update the organization's governance process over time, then we can have kind of soft norms that allow, um, in my opinion, like an ability to even kind of talk about cooperatives in the DAO space did not exist until we were able to have tooling that was more accessible to people, uh, because previously it was, um, you had to be much more technically involved in the ecosystem even to participate. So building technical tools that increase cultural patterns of participation, I would say information symmetry, the kind of principle that uh, what for those at any tier inside or outside of an organization, information should be made accessible if it's a kind of public impact organization, that's very important. Um, but there isn't necessarily one prescriptive norm, just like a collection of tools for a different set of cultural patterns. Wow, I mean that's a. It seems like a. It's it's such an exciting space because it feels really new in a lot of ways, and it's also just really exciting because the excitement from the community about the new tools being developed, the new possibilities. Um, you know, it, there's so much energy in in this space at the moment. Well, um, I, uh, let me ask you a question from the other direction. Um, so. And it's you know it basically winds up you know or, or boils down to what um, how can tra more quote unquote traditional organizations such as gray area but like what role do they play in this development because it's fairly interesting you know we I guess sort of share a lineage with a lot of these post war kind of art and technology organizations and it's one of the antecedents right where. The idea is to, um, well, one of the things we're up to is these collaborations between art and technology on an organizational or corporate level. Um, largely, it hasn't worked with some notable exceptions. Like, they don't, you know, it doesn't, that idea of integrating artists into these traditional companies in San Francisco, I can tell you from people doing it for, you know, 30 years now, hasn't worked. Um, mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is in Web3, it kind of is just happening organically. You have cultural movements that are pushing technology development and tools. You have those supporting different sorts of cultural structures and things like that. So like beyond, um, you know, we have the advantage of being a brick and mortar space that has like people doing things with physical things in space. But be so beyond something like just okay we have to adopt these tools to survive in a certain sense if it's the future you know like get on board from the other direction what do you think kind of DAOs are lacking that some of the arts organizations and other cultural you know uh, what do you call it civil society organizations that are out there can contribute from the other direction sure so i think there's a few key ways that could be pursued. Um, I think, as I also mentioned in the talk, just like, I think traditional kind of organizational and kind of almost management consulting style work within from DAOs and back and forth, basically looking at how some DAOs have that kind of reduced divide between artists, galleries, collectors, but also vice versa, kind of um, role management or knowledge management is something that institutions do have a leg up on in terms of just having internal processes, not always very well, but to some extent, um, and just having like an idea of what the institutional knowledge is over time. So basically being able to have this type of uh, institutional memory and gathering and a strong sense of the archive uh, that I think DAOs are really starting to grab onto, but um, are still in their younger phases of understanding what it means to have like 
an on-chain organization, but also just one that preserves its own archive over time, like a kind of mnemonic institution. I think what I would like to see is uh, um, maybe not across the board, with, uh, but with many key aligned institutions, is that I think DAOs have not yet gotten to the stage where they're able to be kind of multi-organizational networks. And so in the sense that you have many different institutions, and I always ask, like, when people come to me saying, oh, we want to become a DAO, I say, well, what is it you're trying to decentralize? Is it membership? Is it access to resources? Um, and often that that is really much more implicit than people think it is. Um, it, it seems obvious, but it's usually not the actual first answer. And I think that what organizations could do is kind of decentralize the network in which they persist and have stronger linkages between institutions. So I think that they could play a role in kind of becoming a node within a given DAO network and include their members and their audience in this kind of network of institutions that have become kind of DAOified, let's say, and have one general kind of higher level mission that's shared across them. And that would be super powerful in terms of um, building DAO kind of memory gathering or institutional archives and also just increasing network resilience. So short answer is um, participating as organizations within a larger DAO network of aligned institutions. It's, um, it's certainly, you know, an exciting possibility. Um, and, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, different institutions are able to adapt and, imp and implement some of these tools in order to create more equitable organizational and decision making strategies. Um, you know, amidst all of it, you know, this is, a, you know, I would love to, this is kind of a, a simple question, but I'd love to know just from your perspective, because there's a lot of rhetoric um, on the internet about that really goes down a very starkly utopian or very starkly dystopian pathway. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of discourse kind of in the middle. Um, and I'd love to know just from your perspective, what projects or opportunities are most exciting to you right now in, in this space? And what things are you nervous about or would you caution folks to be wary of? Sure. I think what I'm most excited about is um, a kind of, particularly in the context of this conversation, a transfer of resources, which also translates into a transfer of more institutional power to artists or potentially to people who might not traditionally, with, at least within the past several decades, have had access to these things as easily. Of course, there are still questions, and maybe on the, to answer on the flip side of this, I think um, being able to address questions of class and that actual distribution um, have not fully been encompassed. And I think that also potentially what I see as the more negative side is that as uh, Nathan Schneider recently remarked, is like when you open DAO platforms, often the thing that you first see is like a transaction list or a treasury balance. So basically, it's the fact on one side, there's, there's many things I could answer for both, but in the context of this conversation, on one side, I'm very excited for this transfer of resources, aka transfer of institutional power to artists. On the other side, I'm very worried about that becoming the main form of, re of institutional power of that financialization. Um, and I think that there are things that can stimulate this, like, you know, if a multi-sig open to a group chat rather than a transaction list, um, and really, like, what is the game if it's not um, a kind of purely uh, financially financial end game? Like, what is the actual institutional power a few layers beneath that? Um, these are, I think, the most important questions that like you can dive into the space and work on today because it's still we're still so far, I think, upstream from the impact that it will have that working on it now could have greater impact. Totally. Um, that, though, though that's a, I, I love that answer. Um, and I think it's just so thoughtful and just speaks to how thoughtfully you're thinking about building these tools and making them available to people. Um, just so everybody knows, I dropped some links in the chat to, to Gnosis and to the Zodiac project. So you can check out how those work and learn a little bit more there. And there's um, also the, um, there's an article on mirror that's uh, I like that. I like that actually. Oh, did you yeah. put that in? That's yeah, important, that's... I think, for people to read, and the previous one that's on uh, identities and uh, inventories. 
Yeah, we'll drop all of those um, and share them afterwards as well. Um, but we have a couple of, of questions from the audience um, that I'd love to, to bring to your attention. One comes from one of my favorite NFT artists, uh, Digital Coleman. Um, and he asks, how do DAOs think about or deal with passiveness or lack of participation due to time? I may be invested in many spaces, but not have time to be active in them all. And I think this is a really interesting question because, you know, just from my own experience participating on Twitter and in Discord rooms with different kinds of um, uh, crypto communities, it's a lot of, there's a high attention demand. Um, and I can see that becoming a problem for folks who can't, participate at that kind of level sure so yeah this is a, a pretty common pattern in this space that a lot of DAOs face like voter apathy um and many DAOs kind of seek to overcome this through like token fomo which is obviously not the answer um there's i think that we're seeing a shift in coming from like initiatives related to the crypto space but it's likely also tangentially outside like black swan and others which is just a group of artists thinking through basically DAOs without blockchain but the question of um, how can you make kind of governance and events, so what if you had kind of specific votes or other things kind of become more forthright and more fun to participate in? I personally think, um, and it's a, this is a bit in the talk and a bit in the essay, but like that DAOs should go more towards like a network of teams rather than a kind of thinking through a whole, whole large scale organization that has one flat governance process across all of the decisions um, because what I want to see is like more, as I say, like tacit knowledge or practical knowledge, basically more people who have experience related to a specific proposal or a specific initiative um, be kind of ushered into participating in that decision specifically. And of course they can participate in others not to block off in that way, but making sure not that everyone participates in every proposal, but that the people who have related experience in state have discoverability and access to the proposals that are most related to them is, is to me like the more promising way to combat uh, voter apathy and also to combat, I think, what is like a failure of um, thinking through like one overarching governance to process to fit an entire token network. Absolutely, totally. Um, what a, that's an interesting way to, to, to approach this this problem. Um, I mean, this is not something that is, you know, relegated to the crypto space, but I think is relegated to, you know, it, it applies to all spaces of labor and technology and social media. Um, you know, and I hope that, you know, through decentralized technologies, maybe we can, maybe this can be an opportunity to push back against some of the demands of the attention economy. Um, we have another question from the audience that comes from Oddball. Um, and they ask, it seems like most DAOs voting systems are based on majorities, but often we see majorities can be oppressive to minority voices and interests. Have you seen any attempts at balancing the voting systems to bring equity to the underrepresented? Sure. So there's a few like really um, lower level things that need to be implemented right now. Like one for my team uh, that we're, I think we're going to tackle is potentially like zero knowledge proof voting, but basically... Um, uh, private voting systems because I mean there's the majority problem but there's also a collusion problem particularly when votes are public that leads often to kind of majority voting um, so that's a really basic level of infrastructure that needs to become more common for um, the problem highlighted here there's also other voting systems like uh, conviction voting um, which I suppose still still could go the majority side but the basic premise behind conviction voting that's interesting is basically that um, rather than having a vote at one time, you continuously signal your preference. So if you say like, yes, I would like to fund this community project from our treasury, and you say yes at the beginning, your vote becomes more powerful over time as long as you hold that yes position. However, potentially something could change before the decision is made, or potentially it's funding on a kind of longer basis, and then you might switch your vote to no. And so you've lost the kind of strength of your vote. And basically what you have is a kind of continually signaled preference from everyone in the organization over time that is not a plutocratic and is also not necessarily like a one person, one vote. It's like one person, one continuous signal. Um, so there's a lot of interesting granular governance mechanisms that don't exactly look to like the instant of voting um, that we get a lot of the kind of um, what some might call problems with majority voting. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, thinking about governments and I mean, voting just makes me think about, you know, you know, Barry was mentioning the application for arts institutions. And, you know, I'm in- also interested in kind of the larger policy side of, of this conversation. You know, um, it's diff- I think it's difficult for bureaucratic organizations, institutions, governing bodies to adapt to technology in a way that's expedient with the progress of, of innovation. Um, and that's been a age old problem since the beginning of, since the beginning of, you know, uh, you know, the, the invention of the wheel. Um, and I'm wondering how, like, how would you like to see this technology or how even do you envision this technology being included in like government policy or practice? Like how should legislators think about dealing with these kinds of new organizational and voting structures? Yeah, I guess there's a few that I could, I could answer that question in like the immediate present. Um, but I think maybe the more interesting answer is the one on like a five to 10 year outlook. And that I do think like something like protocol governance. So the idea that you have a collection of assets related to a particular mission held by a specific network and that decisions about that mission that are capitalized will be needs will need to have um, be enacted by this network, and then I do think that we'll see this as an increasing kind of governance form, whether it's on local level, you know, say city DAOs or just um, general kind of uh, let's say chain networks, um, and that thinking through kind of protocol governance as a legitimate political process um, now, in order to observe the new types of cultural patterns it creates in five to ten years, I think is when the the real um, political incorporation can be done. I think right now the kind of current legislative outlook really needs to have more insight into what's happening um, on a factual level. Um, I also think, I also think like DAOs um, propose a certain kind of new aspect to political organizing related to being able to preserve their memory directly like through the action of it. And that this is really promising for um, specifically civic or public institutions. And that um, basically those institutions being able to go to DAOs now and be like, this is our archive, this is our wiki, this is how we do it. And then working together can produce that type of um, incorporation. Mm, mm. It's, you know, it's going to be a long road and it's going to take a lot of time and consultation. Um, You know, I think that... um, it's, you know, there's, this is such a complex problem. And I think, you know, it's going to be, a, it's going to be one step at first just to get governing bodies, uh, you know, national governments to accept cryptocurrencies as legitimate currency. I know we just saw this happen in Brazil, um, uh, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be slow. <laughs> it's still early days. And I think, you know, it's really, that's interesting, you know, going back to the title of your talk of prehistory of DAOs, really speaking to how this is just the beginning of something. This is, you know, a small seed of something that's going to grow and grow in the coming, in the coming years. Um, we have one more question from the audience. Um, and this person asks, how do we reckon with the need for member scale in DAOs and the complexity that more members bring? Mm-hmm. So I think um, partially related to an earlier answer of having teams or having kind of people who have deep practical knowledge in certain areas in which the DAO operate and their ability to discover proposals as well as opportunities related to their experience and their objectives. Um, and really right now, I think DAOs need a focus and other internet, the research group is doing a lot of work on this, Um, but basically on information discoverability, because right now it's uh, quite strewn across chat rooms, across forums, across um, different governance votes on different platforms. Uh, So focusing on information discoverability so that there is still coherence for people who are participating to find the mission and area they want to participate means that um, Uh, Not everyone needs to kind of apply themselves or read all of the documentation, although of course that's welcome. Um, But basically being able to to have broadly aligned, a pluralism of missions, which people can work on that are broadly aligned, uh, will be one way to address issues of scale. And yeah, I think think right now it's like a promise that DAOs, DAOs will scale, and that's like their main ideological promise. And it's, you know, what does it mean to scale? It means to get bigger. Okay, like 
that's that's only so interesting. I think like can can they scale to the not necessarily grow in membership size, but can they um, potentially access greater expertise and decision making or deeper practical tacit knowledge or kind of more stakeholders who should be involved in governance processes and then basically surface their experience and also surface better information discovery from the DAO's knowledge, knowledge management and put those two together. Um, that would be the ideal outcome rather than just kind of increasing an organization's size, let's say. Totally. Oh, that's really interesting. That's a problem that I hadn't, I hadn't thought about before. You know, some of these groups are getting so huge and I mean, it's, you need a whole per, you know, groups like friends with benefits this uh social token you know i know that they like you know hire people to manage all their social media because it's be gone beyond something that you know uh anybody or you know a small team can manage without you know robust support um we're just about out of time you know and kia i really thank you for your time julian barry do you have any uh last questions um for kia it's all you julia <laughs> Um, I mean, this is this is all like amazing and very much like outside of my knowledge base. At least I feel that way. <laughs> but I mean, maybe you can. I, I know you sort of entered your talk, but maybe you could talk a little bit about your like create your creative practice and what some of the outcomes of your like creative work look like. I know you're doing a lot of writing, and um, so I'd be interested to hear how that's how like your research is manifesting in a creative output. Sure. So I think particularly with the Zodiac project, so the kind of collection of DAO tools we just launched was the project that I've had probably the most autonomy to work on with our team. And it's been really nice to kind of combine my interests both in like um, kind of symbolic, resilient knowledge systems, which is what I consider like zodiacal uh, symbols, and also just my interest in organizing. And I guess less from a social practice lens, but just from personal experience, I think uh, as like an artist in this space before, I always felt like um, I needed to work on the infrastructure um, to enable the art that I wanted to make. Mm. And a lot of that infrastructure was based on being able to kind of gather resources for many groups, but also technical infrastructure for groups to coordinate and make work together. And that... I always thought of it as like building the infrastructure to make the work and not making the work, but then building the infrastructure also became like uh, fundamentally embedded with the work. Mm. Um, and that I see that in the future, like I think writing is probably my dominant art practice at the moment and being able to almost kind of create a sci-fi narrative that can be implemented in practice and actually build tools that people can use from that. I don't believe that art has to be useful in any way. But I think it is really interesting when art can create like uh, cultural patterns that other people can use that are also technical objects. And I'm just, I'm really enjoying that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's really exciting. I love, no, that's, that's a really beautiful way to think about it because I, you know, I think that a lot of people like, you know, you, what you, what you mentioned reminded me of, you know, work by Travis Smalley, for instance, who creates drawing tools and, you know, his practice became, he was really obsessed with digital drawing tools and then he started building his own and that became the, the, you know, that became a, such a huge part of his practice. Um, and I think that it's also a really interesting way to think through the theme of the festival worlding protocol. You know, if you, you know, it's not just about the output, it's how we think through the processes as well at every, uh, you know, kind of every step of the way. Um, so it's really cool to hear. Thank you so much, Kia, for being here. I think we're just out of time. We've kept you longer than we probably should have. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Kia. Yeah, thanks for staying on. It's nighttime in Lisbon, so yeah. um, get to the party or whatever. Yeah, of course. Cheers from Southern Portugal. Uh, thank you all so much and take care. Thank you.